Chapter 7. It's spooky down there. They stood by the windows for a long time, watching the storm-lashed trees twist and writhe, bending almost double. Wind drove the rain in slanting sheets across the yard. I wonder where Tiger is, said Raymond. He must be out there somewhere. Kev took in the wild scene with the sweep of his arm. Wherever he is, he's all wet. So is Dad's mitt. Scott scowled at the rain. Maybe not, said Rusty. Tiger probably found a place to hole up, too. Anyway, he's not going to come until the storm is over. Let's go sort through the junk and see what we can find. They turned from the window and saw footprints in the dust all over the room. Who's been walking around? Scott asked. Nobody. Looks like Tiger's been here after all, said Eric. He couldn't have gotten in without us seeing him, said Kev. We were watching the house and the road all the time. Not all the time. Scott gave Raymond a dark look. Not while we were across the stream looking at the bear track. Rusty put his finger to his lips and motioned them into a huddle. Tiger must have come in to get out of the rain, too, he whispered. I'll bet he's still here in the house. Nobody would go out in that storm. Let's find him, Scott whispered fiercely. It won't take long. The old house only had three small rooms, the bedroom, the kitchen, and the living room they were in. Four if you counted the lean-to room that had been added on the back. Scott rushed into the, into the bedroom doorway and looked inside. The room was empty except for a homemade bunk built in the corner and a wooden crate nailed to the wall to form a cupboard. There wasn't even a closet, just a thin peeled pole suspended from two loops of rusty bailing wire fastened to the rafters. Footprints crisscrossed the room from the window to the bunk, to the doorway, and back again several times. There was no place to hide except under the bunk. Scott bent down to peer under it. Nothing was there. Scott turned to the others and shook his head. They trooped back across the living room to the kitchen. An old iron cook stove, red with rust, stood in the corner across from the back door. Next to it was a wood box, half filled with split wood. A homemade plank table and a bench took up the middle of the room. In the center of the table sat an old kerosene lamp with no chimney and an inch of fuel in the bottom of the glass base. There were no cabinets or cupboards, only a closet-sized pantry lined with shelves. There's no place for Tiger to hide in here, said Rusty, reaching up and taking down a small cardboard box from the top of the warming oven on the stove. He must have gone out the bedroom window when he heard us coming. Rusty started to poke through the contents of the box. Scott looked at the floor. There were footprints here, too. Some led out the door to the lean-to and some coming back. There were so many, it was impossible to tell which way Tiger went last. Scott pointed to the prince. Maybe Tiger just wants us to think he did, he whispered. We haven't looked out there yet. He pointed to the sagging, half-open door. Rusty put down the box, and they all crept quietly through the door into the lean-to. There was no way Tiger could have gotten out of there. The two narrow high windows were too small even for Raymond to crawl through, and the door leading to the outside was blocked with rusting farm tools. It didn't take long to search the dark corners under the workbench and behind the piles of discarded junk. 
A sick feeling settled in the pit of Scott's stomach. Tiger must have climbed out the bedroom window, like he said. Now I'll never get Dad's mitt back. Don't worry, we'll find Tiger. Eric put a comforting hand on Scott's shoulder. But there's nothing we can do until the storm's over. We might as well sort through all this junk and figure out what we can take back with us, said Rusty. There's a lot of good stuff here. Some of it will be worth a lot more than old Oscar. Scott didn't feel like looking at junk, but he nodded and picked up some old hand tools from the workbench. They were welded together with rust. He put them down and looked around. Some of the things like the old plow, the long handled scythe, and the big two-man bucking saw hanging on the wall were the same kinds of things he had seen in the Pioneer Museum. But they could never carry that stuff out on their bikes. He was looking at the old washboard hanging on the wall near the door when he noticed Raymond tugging at something on the floor. What are you doing? Scott asked, walking over to see. Trying to open this door, Raymond said through tight teeth. Everybody dropped what they were doing and crowded around. It is a door, said Rusty. How come we never noticed it before? Hurry up and open it, said Kev. It's stuck. Raymond's face turned red as he tugged on the iron ring. The door came up an inch, then snapped back in place as if it were held from the other side. Here, let, let me give it a try, said Eric. Raymond stepped back. Eric braced his feet, grasped the ring firmly with both hands, and yanked. The door flew open so fast, Eric almost fell through the opening. A damp, musty smell rose to meet them as they leaned over and peered into the hole. There were spider webs woven into the corners and steps leading down into the darkness. Scott shivered. It's spooky down there. Eric put his hands on his knees and tried to see into the darkness. I wonder where the steps go. Grinning, Kev nudged him with his air elbow. Dare you to find out. Darers go first. Eric backed up a step. I'd go if I had a light, Kev said, said it in an offhanded way as he edged away from the opening. Can't see anything in the dark. Rusty disappeared and came back a minute later with an old lamp in one hand and a shiny small metal cylinder in the other. Here's your light, he shoved the lamp into Kev's hands, unscrewed the top of the cylinder, he took out a wooden match. Kev's eyes widened. Those matches are too old to light. No, they're not. Some hiker or hunter must have left them here last fall. The matches are waterproof. Rusty struck the first match. It sputtered and died. Kev looked a little green as the second one blazed up, strong and bright. Rusty held it to the wick. A little tongue of orange flame spread and burned steadily. There you go. I'm not going down there. Kev shoved the lamp into Eric's hands. Not me. Eric tried to pass the lamp to Scott. The thought of going down into the dark, closed-in place, made Scott feel suddenly cold all over. His mouth went dry. His chest began to feel tight. It was hard, it was getting hard to breathe. I'll go. Raymond took the lamp from Eric and stepped down onto the first step. Scott wanted to stop him, but he couldn't move. He opened his mouth, but no words came out. Raymond took another step.